Just hang out on Ares Live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, another VJUG session. Uh, today's VJUG session is is being broadcast live from the home of rugby here in uh, Twickenham, Twickenham in London. I'm at uh, Twickenham Stadium at uh, an IBM Developer Connect event. So, uh, so it's awesome to be here. Uh, also joining me today, uh, Star Attraction is um, at Cart Ben, Benjamin K. How are you doing, Ben? I'm good. I'm actually I'm in the home of rugby. I mean, Toulouse, France. This is the ah. home for rugby. That that's like the <laughs> second home. If, uh, if yeah, if, I guess. If, if if you're an MP, that would be the one you would be claiming for. That would be your second home, I think. Um, but no, today you're going to be giving a session on uh, on Java and the Internet of Things. Your background, you uh, work with the Eclipse Foundation, right? Yep, I'm uh, I'm working full time for the foundation since February. Before that, I was yeah much, very much involved with uh, several uh, open source IoT projects uh, uh, that uh, well my employer at the time brought to to Eclipse, and now I'm basically the evangelist for the about 20 projects that we have to do IoT. Awesome, awesome. Um, and uh, with us today, uh, we have Oleg and uh, Oliver. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hey, everybody. Uh, I asked Oleg to hop on because Google Hangouts is hating on me big time right now, and I've literally spent the last 18 minutes trying to log on, and it just worked. So I don't know whether it was going live that did it, but I have a short rope here from which I was about to hang myself. Um, so in case I in case I happen to disappear throughout, it was <laughs> saying hi to everybody. And Oleg, uh, Oleg, uh, Oleg, in case you guys don't know, me and Oleg are the guys behind Rebel Labs. When Simon donates some of his goodness too, Oleg, uh, do you have anything from Rebel Labs you'd like to describe uh, that's upcoming, perhaps? Uh, yeah, maybe yes. So hi, uh, hi, Oleg. So, and Rebel Labs is preparing currently a new report, so, you know, we, we give and we create and give out those free technical reports on all things Java. So, the upcoming one is about IDs, about the plugins that you install into those IDs that make them more functional, but less performant sometimes. And then about the shortcuts that, uh, that you use and love to use that makes your ID more performant for you. So... Tune in uh, in the upcoming days. I would say we'll release that. And uh, and with Ben here, I guess we should just confirm that all our favorite all our favorite IDs are, are Eclipse. Is that right? I was uh, I was actually going to say it's quite fitting that that Ben is with us today, because uh, almost fifty percent of Java developers out there use Eclipse, and if you include some of the alternative uh, distributions or implementations like Spring Tool Suite and what JBoss Dev Studio, My Eclipse, Rad, uh, the Eclipse platform is definitely dominating Java. So most likely all of you guys out there, or some of you, what, the guy next to you, if not you, is using Eclipse. And uh, this is going to be a great report. And uh, without further ado, let's... Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Let's let's hand over to to Benjamin. The question I'm hoping uh, Benjamin will answer today is: is is the world of IoT even ready for a specification? So, without further ado, let's hand over to Ben. Thanks, guys. Uh, well, I guess one thing I I should mention first: uh, well, I'm probably not going to talk so much about the ID. I'm going to talk about lots of um, well open source projects we have at Eclipse for doing IoT, Internet of Things. But you don't actually need the um, the Eclipse ID to use, uh, to use the technology. So let me share uh, the slides that, that I have for you guys, uh, which would be here. Um, yeah, uh, w basically the idea today is to show some some code, some pointers for you guys to get started with the uh, Internet of Things. That I'm sure uh, I'm sure you've heard uh, people telling you that in the in the next decade we will have 20, 50 uh, billion devices. Some people start even talking about trillion devices. Well, I guess uh, the, uh, it's big, right? IoT is big, but one uh, figure that I think is actually more important is uh, is this one from a recent uh, a recent study. 
that basically says that uh, uh, if we want to actually, if we if we are to have that many devices uh, by 2020, we are actually going to need lots of developers, and developers usually they they, they need open source, right? Uh, so. Uh, uh, if you uh, want to build solutions like uh, connecting thermostats and, and cars and, and whatnot, I'm not sure you want to, to use proprietary SDKs and, and, and protocols for which you don't even know uh, the specification. So, um, yeah, what I want to talk about today is uh, basically what we call the Open IoT Stack for Java. Uh, well, uh, we just said that Eclipse is obviously an IDE, but it's actually a community uh just like well just like apache right apache is not just the http server eclipse is not just the id it's a lot of of, of open source technology for building runtimes server-side technology uh tooling of course uh but it turns out we have um this iot initiative that has been uh, going on for for a couple of years now and we actually have uh, an, an end-to-end -end stack for building um, IoT solutions. And this is exactly what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, if I were to yeah, simplify what is the Internet of Things, it's really about making sure that the, the devices of our day-to-day -day life, as I said, our cars, thermostats, uh, sensors of, of every kind, uh, could, can be connected to the internet, uh, which means we will have at some point some embedded uh, sensors, uh, some electronic devices, actuators um, that we we need to uh, to talk to, um, hopefully using Java. So we're gonna we're gonna see how it's gonna work, and we want to bridge them to the internet. We will need to use some sort of gateway. If you're uh, tinkering, it's likely you're gonna use a Raspberry Pi, a BeagleBone, stuff like that. Uh, but there are actually also industrial solutions, obviously, to 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 build what what is actually uh, yeah called a gateway, bridging the sensors to the internet. Um, what you want to do is talk to some sort of server at some point in order to send data, uh, temperature data, uh, make sure that uh, yeah from using some APIs you'll be able to control uh, the devices on the field. Uh, well, the thing is you don't necessarily need. A backend. You don't necessarily need uh, uh, to run anything in the cloud if you're talking about a solution that is basically uh, you want to control your house, your uh, own your own home automation solution. In that case, you might actually have uh, a user front end uh, like a web UI, a mobile UI, talking directly to the gateway. Uh, you will need a cloud or a server whenever you want to manage a fleet of devices, right? So. Uh, actuator sensors, what, what it is uh, that's uh, available in the Java world to do <laughs> what a sensor would do, that is sensing the, phys the physical environment, temperature, humidity, uh, whatever, uh, and actuators to act on the environment, uh, uh, controlling, um, uh, of course, turning an LED on or off, that's kind of the hello world for IoT. But I mean, there are many uh, things you can act upon, obviously. So. Um, using Java, uh, assuming that you run uh, on Linux, well, one option would be to use uh, the CFS APIs. Uh, you, if if you've ever played with um, GPIOs on Linux, uh, you you know that um, on your file system uh, slash sys slash class, there's basically some magic files that you can manipulate to uh, to toggle LEDs or to 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 control. Uh, to access um, an SPI device, stuff like that. So you could certainly do that from from your Java code. That works. Uh, what won't work is, or what will be difficult to do, is uh, efficiently react to to changes on on the sensors. Like uh, if you want to to monitor uh, the, the the status of a switch, well, you don't really want to pull your your file system. So at some point you need to manipulate directly the the, the native CFS, CFS APIs, and for that you can actually use Py4j, which we will see in the next slide is basically a, a Java API on top of a, a nat native C library that will allow you to have. Uh, very nice APIs to do GPIOs, I scratch the SPI, uh, and basically manipulate your sensors in a very uh, convenient way from your Java code. Uh, more recently, uh, the device IO API is something that you can, well, API wise, actually, it looks very, uh, very much like Py4j. 
and it's available in OpenJDK and tells you to, to, to basically not, you don't need to rely on the external um, Py4j stuff and it, it's built in and even more built in, in if you do Java ME obviously. So a few a few words and a few well a few yeah a few more words about Py4j especially since uh, this is what I I will be using in the context of the demo uh, I have for you guys later. Um, Py4j it's an open source project. You go to py4j.com. It provides all the APIs as I said for GPIO, I squared C, SPI. These are all uh, protocols basically for manipulating digital sensors, um, actuators. It's based on the wiring pi uh, C library, and so of course using JNI, you can manipulate uh, that from your uh, Java code. There are some nice extensions. If you want to, one thing that is, again, uh, in the context of, of today's uh, talk and today's demo, I'm going to talk about um, a, a demo based on the Raspberry Pi because, uh, well, quite frankly, right now most people are still uh, prototyping, right, for, for IoT. And one way of prototyping it is to start with a Raspberry Pi. If you do use a Raspberry Pi, you can certainly hook sensors directly to it. But what you won't have access to uh, will be, for example, analog uh, sort of sensors. If you want to, to manipulate uh, um, uh, a thermistor uh, or a photo uh, register, that will be using an analog input, right? And that is not built in in the Raspberry Pi. You would need to use an external shield. And uh, well, it turns out Pi4j has support for uh, such shields, so that's uh, that's a nice uh, nice to, uh, thing to have. Lots of code samples, and actually, if you were to blink an LED, uh, that will be how the code looks like. It's pretty pretty simple. Uh, you basically instantiate whatever is the the um, the pin corresponding to where you connected your LED on, on the Raspberry Pi. And then well, you can basically directly set uh, the the output voltage on the pin uh, to be high or low, or you can even use the toggle method if you don't even want to bother um, knowing and remembering the state of your GPIO. So that will be well very uh, very short intro to how you could manipulate GPIOs on the Raspberry Pi. Well, quite frankly, this is not really the trickiest part. Um, well, maybe if you use a very uh, funky uh, I squared C sensor, you will need to have a look at the data sheet of the of the sensor to know what kind of uh, uh, what is the kind of protocol you need to use to talk to the sensor. But all in all, um, that's um, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. If you've ever used an Arduino, uh, blinking an LED or, uh, or getting the getting the actual sensor data is not really the most difficult part. What is actually where most of the the, the stuff happens is on the gateway. Uh, gateway being, well, again, if you're prototyping, it would be a Raspberry Pi, right? Uh, you you want something uh, that allows you to, to, to connect sensors. So in that case on the Raspberry Pi, you have the pretty convenient uh, uh, pins over here where you can connect a sensor over GPIO, SPI, s c and you have internet connectivity, right? That would be ethernet built in, uh, or you use a Wi-Fi dongle, um, 3G dongle would work as well. And that's one kind of gateway. Another kind of gateway would be like this, more industrial kind of gateway. Not only is it ruggedized, that is, you can have that in, in a factory in a very humid environment, uh, but also you have uh, way more um, ways to connect sensors. Like there is a CAN bus, there is a serial port, uh, um, several Ethernet uh, port, several Ethernet interfaces. Uh, it's very likely that this gateway also has built-in um, uh, cellular connectivity. Um, but yeah, all in all, this is the kind of device you use for bridging the sensors to the cloud. So at some point, you need to run some code in the gateway that will take the data from the sensors, maybe consolidate the data locally, and send that to a server. So what is the goal? Uh, what is the, the yeah? What is the the response? Possibility of the gateway, uh, two things, making sure that we have um, a nice and convenient way to uh, connect the sensors to the world. So 
at some point we might use Py4j or we might use some uh, write some sort of embedded code to get values from the sensors, but then we need a way to, to communicate with the cloud, with, with the server and with the other things basically uh, in a very efficient way. And the other important aspect is the management of, of, the, of what's on the field. That is when you deploy an IoT solution, you want to have a way to manage the software that's running on the field. You want to be able to upgrade the software. You want to be able to monitor the battery level of your device. If it's a device, uh, a solution that is embedding a GPS, maybe you want to, to, to be able to monitor the, um, the GPS, uh, the, the location of, the, of, of your solution. Um, independently, I would say, of the software that is running uh, on, um, the, yeah, you want some sort of framework, some sort of operating system for IoT, if you will, to, to, to do all the, all the device management. Hey, hey, Ben, we've just got a... Uh, yeah, I was actually uh, about to ask you whether there are questions at that point. Uh, not so much questions, we've just got one more question, and this is, uh, I'm sure Oliver is going to laugh on, on mute at this, because this is a request that I always get when I speak. Um, would you mind just slowing down slightly when you, as you talk, just, uh, just, just so that everyone can hear clearly? Um, this is something I always get asked, so it gives me great pleasure in, in asking someone else. <laughs> great, will do. Cool. And, and just, uh, to let, just to let everyone know if you have any questions at all, uh, put them in IRC, and I'll ask Ben as we go. Cheers, Ben. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so um, back to uh, yeah, two two main, at least in my opinion, two main things that a gateway is responsible for is managing the connectivity to the network and uh, enabling the management of what is it you're running on your device. Um, like if you want to deploy several applications, uh, you need your application, your um, your gateway to provide you basically with an application container, right? So, is there something that uh, helps us uh, in the context of IoT? Well, well, we'll see about that. So, for connecting, um, well, what are the differences between a regular kind of uh, IoT solution and and an IoT uh, solution? Well, uh, we're usually talking about solutions that are um, connected by means of a wireless communication, right? So, um, as I said earlier, when presenting the gateways, uh, usually you would have um, connectivity. Um, say you have a, um, a solar panel on the roof uh, of, your, uh, of your cottage and you want to, to monitor the electricity production uh, over the air, right? So, uh, you will probably use a say a cellular uh, connectivity uh, 2G, 3G, you have a data plan uh, that you want to be as cheap as possible, uh, maybe a buck per month. So you will have for, for that um, for that money, you, you will probably get maybe a megabyte per month of, of, of bandwidth, right? So you want a protocol that is uh, as efficient as possible um, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of bandwidth usage, right? You might want to use HTTP if you really communicate uh, not often at all, but uh, usually uh, you will want to use either co-op or MQTT. So co-op uh, in a nutshell is basically uh, HTTP over UDP. So uh, instead of using TCP, it's using UDP, which means that uh, you're uh, already saving quite a lot of, uh, of bytes just because you don't have the overhead of, of, of TCP. Um, and yeah, basically you replicate the, the, the REST, RESTful model of HTTP. So we're going to see in a few in a few slides uh, in more detail what how CoAP works. And basically the the model, the communication model with CoAP is that the um, your IoT uh, solution on the field will basically be acting as a a, a, a tiny HTTP slash I mean co-op server that you can query from uh, from the cloud and, and get uh, can get da get data be notified whenever there's new data and stuff like that. Other option is to use MQTT. Um, it's uh, well very similar to AMQP. It's it's uh, um, a publish subscribe uh, protocol. You have the um, devices on the field, the MQTT clients talking to a central uh, server, a broker, and then uh, you can have other clients subscribe to the broker to, to be notified whenever data is available. You can structure your messages using um, topics. So 
uh, co-op, yeah, as I said, it's really uh, having web uh, uh, endpoints on, on, on the field. So if we're talking about a, a light bulb, well, we can easily imagine having a resource uh, that uh, allows us to turn the, the light on or off. You know, we will put or post um, a message on, on that resource and we will be able to toggle the status of, of, the, of the light or uh, we can get the, um, the red, green or blue channel of the, of the light bulb maybe. So that really the idea is that every, and basically the idea is that uh, we are, uh, with co-op, you're betting on um, IPv6 uh, in that uh, with IPv6, every device is gonna have an IP address anyways. So it's, it's actually way more convenient to, to address a device uh, by, using uh, either the host name or the IPv6 address of the device and you just query it directly and of course you need to put some um, security in place but we uh, I guess we will touch base uh, and yeah talk about security at some point later during the presentation so co-op um, in Java how do you do some uh, co-op then that would be California um, eclipse.org slash California you go there you, you download uh, the code which will basically, uh, yeah, it's it's not meant uh, at least the prime the the the, the focus uh, the original focus is not on on making that um, meant to run on Java ME for example. Uh, right now it's um, more uh, the kind of stuff you would run on a regular SC uh, kind of device, either a Raspberry Pi or on, on you would run that on the server as well. It implements DTLS, which is basically the equivalent of SSL and TLS for uh, for datagrams for, for UDP provides nice features to uh, to um, have a, a trivial way to bridge uh, from a co-op to HTTP back and forth basically these are the main the same um, notion you're manipulating uh, in both worlds so bridging is actually pretty straightforward and uh, yeah, implementing a co-op resource, uh, it's basically if you know how to, to write a, a, a servlet, you know how to write a, a co-op endpoint. Uh, you have yeah, three, four classes that you need to know about, uh, the server, the resource, and the exchange. Um, so yeah, you basically subclass the co-op resource, uh, create as many resources as, you, as you'd like, uh, attach them, mount them on, on a, a co-op server, and you start the server, so that would be uh, how you would implement uh, a co-op uh, Hello World resource using um, California, uh, California's APIs. If you are, um, yeah, whether you, you, you have something meaningful to do for the get, post, put, and delete, uh, you will actually provide an implementation of those methods. Uh, before the get, you uh, answer with some uh, a bytes uh, with a string in the payload. Uh, you can even actually provide a content type. Um, I guess by default it would be text plain. Um, and yeah, post you do whatever you want with the um, uh, depending on on the on the headers uh, that will be provided in the request. The important thing is here is that the headers are going to be binary encoded, right? So you can, uh, even if you have all the, the the cool stuff that comes with HTTP, like um, yeah, providing uh, the, the content types or um, making sure that you can cache the resources and stuff, it's still going to be pretty efficient in terms of bandwidth on, on the wire or or in the air when you will uh, communicate with, with your endpoint. So, so I've got, a couple, of, yeah. got a couple of questions just before we go too deep into MQTT now. Um, one from I am IT um, in IRC is: um, Is it uh, I guess is it usual to use um, co-op and MQTT together, or would you use one or the other? Um, yeah, that's that's actually a good question. Um, I actually see more and more people using both. Um, especially since co-op, uh, I, I, I mentioned the fact that co-op is uh, is kind of uh, very well suited when you're talking IPv6. And uh, well, while I'm sh as I'm sure you know, uh, IPv6 is not yet fully deployed on the internet. 
it's still uh, very much used uh, in the um, in the wireless sensor network uh, world. Um, that is um, everything Zigbee, you know, kind of stuff. The the the, the radio uh, local radio uh, protocols that you could use. Uh, basically, uh, between uh, well, whatever whatever is, is behind a gateway, you you could have sensors that are uh, basically talking, uh, all talking with each other uh, over co-op. So you can uh, basically run co-op in them, and then uh, on your gateway, uh, either you uh, you still run co-op and basically you're just bridging your your sensor network. To the um, to the actual internet, or you can decide that you uh, actually want to uh, to bridge the the co-op uh, world to MQTT and use the the publish subscribe mechanism because it's uh, it's likely that it's going to be more convenient for doing uh, one to many kind of communications and uh, well MQTT has a very large ecosystem of, of libraries available you can do MQTT over web sockets for example so. You might decide that uh, although uh, you're doing co-op locally on your local slash radio network, uh, you may still bridge uh, the, the, the co-op world to, um, to MQTT at some point. Okay. So I hope that does answer the question. Yeah, uh, that does. And, to... and we have one other more general question. Uh, we we'll could probably take it at the end, though, or, or would you like it now? Yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, uh, so it's from Oleg. Um, he's worried about his pizza leftovers. When uh, when fridges and everything will be hackable, how can he trust his pizza leftovers? So in general, in terms of the best practices to secure your Internet of Things um, enabled devices, um, given you can't just turn them off, I guess, remotely, particularly if they have been hacked, how can, how can people trust their devices and and maybe, you know, trust a door lock or a... Or, or a uh, an IoT enabled door lock and, and things like that. How can they trust them? Um, and what, what general security tips would you give? Well, uh, yeah, very quickly, uh, you uh, once you start doing uh, deploying devices on the field and uh, devices that don't, I mean, if, if it's in, in a device you're building yourself, like a Raspberry Pi and so on, well, it's, it's likely that you will be able to have some sort of control on it. It's connecting to your own um, uh, wireless uh, WLAN network and I mean, you, and even physically, the device cannot really be compromised. If we're talking about a door lock or something, uh, well, a device you bought on the sh off the shelf, uh, in, in those devices, actually, there is lots of um, uh, stuff happening without you necessarily, necessarily knowing. Uh, um, like, the, the devices will have uh, secured chips that are actually uh, making sure that uh, there, there is uh, um, a, an encrypted communication between the device and whatever um, server you want the, the device to talk to. There is basically um, yeah a, a, a key uh, that is physically stored in the device itself uh, in a very secure way, as in electronically, right? There is even shielding on top of the chip to make sure that the, the um, uh, you cannot easily access this key, and this is what is going to be used to to secure and and cipher the communication between the device and uh, whatever endpoint you want the device to talk to. Um, and, but still, if at some point the device is somehow compromised, uh, there are, there are some uh, some work being done, uh, especially by the Open Mobile Alliance, uh, which is basically well, they are standardizing um, all the mechanisms that in our actual phones and smartphones allow to do over-the-air firmware upgrades and stuff like that. They are working on a specification co called Lightweight M2M. And as part of this specification, not only do they standardize uh, the security workflows, but there's also um, standard ways of basically, uh, if your device is compromised, um, as in some, someone has been able to, to, to run its own application or stuff like that, um, you can still uh, find a way to communicate with the, the firmware uh, of, the, of the device and basically over the air uh, brick the device you just uh, this is the only like the last thing uh, you will ever do but at least uh, the device will stop talking and so yeah that would be kind of the the way to secure 
Awesome. And, I, and I love the description of bricking the device because it sounds like literally someone just throwing a brick at it. That's awesome. Cool. Thanks very much, guys, for the questions. And uh, uh, continue, please. Sure. Um, so a few more words about MQTT, uh, even if we've uh, briefly mentioned that already. Uh, how does that work? Well, you have a broker. Actually, I just uh, learned a few uh, minutes ago. Uh, well, MQTT is now an Oasis standard, um, and in the in the latest version of the specification, they actually encourage people to 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 talk about the broker in terms of server. In the end, uh, your MQTT clients are talking to an MQTT server. So I guess I'm, I'm going to update my slides afterwards. And what happens is that um, you have clients uh, either, well, something that, that an end user might might want to manipulate, a mobile app uh, written in Android or whatever, a web app uh, running maybe web, web MQTT over web sockets or um, actual devices uh, and or gateways uh, communicating on behalf of the of the sensors uh, that uh, they are connected to. And all of the, these clients can basically use a, um, a publish subscribe model to um, publish data on specific topics um, and consume the data, publish and subscribe. So if I were to build um, a mobile uh, application to display uh, the temperature of my um, of my kettle, and then I could um, in my client connect to the server, subscribe to a specific topic. I can use a wildcard mechanism to make sure that whenever something under uh, that specific hierarchy is going to be available, well, I'm going to be notified, which is exactly what's going to happen whenever another client is going to use. Uh, an MQTT API to publish a message to the broker under a specific topic with a specific payload, the payload being basically a byte array that's up to you to put whatever you'd like in the payload, which is actually, I mean, some people find it disturbing that the payload is uh, very untyped, but it's actually quite convenient. That means that if you want to um, send JSON, uh, XML, um, JPEG images, you can do basically whatever you want and in the end since you uh, I mean you will post on a specific topic and there is there is obviously some sort of contract uh, for on a specific topic you know that uh, other clients are going to expect a specific kind of payloads so in that case it would be a payload that I guess is textual representation of the temperature and whenever the data is going to be published the, um, the, the, the client subscribed is going to receive the data. Um, PAHO, Eclipse PAHO, is, is providing lots of implementations, open source implementations, Java, JavaScript for running in your web browser or web socket, C, C++, .NET, uh, I mean, e even if it's not available in PAHO, uh, you go to GitHub and you will find even more uh, implementations. And if you actually look at the MQTT specification, it's only uh, 15 pages or so, and it's really a uh, pretty straightforward so implementing your own client even if I don't think that would be a good idea given how many uh, implementations are out there uh, would still be an option I guess. Uh, the API uh, pretty simple you connect to a specific broker uh, we actually run a sandbox at Eclipse that you, you can use if, if you'd like I still I always forget to update that slide it should actually say iot.eclipse.org uh, although m2m would work too uh, you connect to the broker and uh, once you're connected you can start sending uh, subscribe or publish um, packets uh, so in that case I would like to subscribe to uh, everything or anything happening under the my gateway um, uh, root uh, topic and then whenever something's going to be available uh, <coughs> the MQTT callback is going to be called and I, I'll know about the topic and I'll know about the message and somewhere in the message, you have actually have, of course, the API to uh, to get the um, the actual byte array, as well as some other uh, flags that could be associated with uh, the message. Um, well, I won't go into many details, but uh, MQTT messages can be retained, for example. So um, that's the kind of stuff you could um, access uh, if you manipulate the MQTT message API. 
if you were to run your own server, um, you have two options. Uh, well, at least two options if you if you're looking at the Eclipse project. Uh, one would be Mosquito. It's an implementation that is in C uh, of of the MQTT uh, of an MQTT server. Of course, it's in C, so it's uh, meant to be highly scalable in terms of footprint. Uh, yeah, a, a thousand uh, connected clients would be roughly three megabytes of uh, footprint in, in RAM. But then if you'd like to integrate a broker in your own Java backend, uh, you might want to have a look at Moquette. It's uh, completely written in Java. It's, it's uh, using the uh, Netty asynchronous IOs and, and based on the LMAX disruptor, the, the, a ring buffer to be very efficient, very scalable. Uh, I think it's also pr it, it also provides an OSGI bundle. So if you'd like to just take the bundle, deploy that in an OSGI environment, it should be pretty pretty straightforward. So any any questions on, on the MQTT front? Uh, not on the MQTT front, but um, there's one uh, question about uh, testing uh, from guest5051. Um, he's wondering how he can um, how he can test his IoT devices. So how he can tell if his IoT solution is perfectly working or not. Well, uh, there. Are, uh, well, it depends what is the, uh, the part you want to test. Um, but if we are talking about like uh, the the sort of software you would run in in your gateway, well, I guess I could have started by when I said that the kind of gateways uh, you could use uh, would be uh, a Raspberry Pi or maybe later on a ruggedized kind of industrial gateway. Even before that, you can actually run the code on your own um, uh, on your desktop, right? If it's uh, as we're going to see in just a few minutes, if you're using uh, a framework like Eclipse Cura for um, for um, developing your embedded um, gateway software, you can uh, perfectly run that in in, uh, in your local environment. Um, but then there are also um, if what you're uh, looking at is running and simulating what would happen if you have. Um, several instances of the solution on the field. Well, there are uh, a few solutions out there, especially if you're looking at building sensor networks. As I mentioned earlier, Zigbee uh, uh, kind of stuff to 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 oversimplify a bit. Well, you can um, yeah, you can use uh, solutions like Contiki. Uh, Contiki is actually a um, a real-time operating system that you would run. In a, in a tiny uh, microcontroller, the kind of microcontroller that would power a, a Zigbee sort of device. And uh, yeah, Contiki comes with a very nice simulating infrastructure where basically you take the binary code that you would put in your in your actual physical device and instead of putting in a, putting it in a device, you put that in the simulator and you ask the simulator to simulate a thousand nodes and and then you see whether your uh, yeah what it means in terms of bandwidth consumption you can even simulate what it's going to mean in terms of battery consumption so all in all i mean it's um yeah e either you use some sort of solutions for simulating the um, actual embedded code or if you're uh, using java then it's Basically, just uh, uh, yeah, up to you to uh, to use whatever um, J. I guess you could use J unit to uh, to to bootstrap um, our, as many Cura instances as, as you'd like if if you're yeah basically running some Java Java code. The usual right once fix bugs everywhere, right? Um, yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> One other question um, from uh, Volodymyr, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, is there a list of devices that already support these protocols, um, e.g. A, web, a website with supported devices or anything like that? Yeah, there are a few. Uh, well, off the top of my head, I'm not quite sure I, I would be able to, to mention the names, but I'm sure we can uh, post that on the Meetup uh, page afterwards. Okay. But yeah, there are more and more uh, devices that have built-in hardware and software support for um, well the kind of protocols uh, I mentioned uh, co-op and uh, well Zigbee, Six Lopan, all that kind of stuff and basically these are uh, routers that you can put uh, at the edge of the network uh, that is well in a factory or, or in your house and you can 
kind of easily configure them to take the values from the sensors using whatever protocols are um, are used in your uh, particular solution and then uh, bridge that to the to the actual internet but yeah there are uh, a few devices like that and i mean uh, some of them have been announced very recently uh, I, I mean i'm sure some of you guys have seen uh, the announcements around the java one especially um, around the ARM and, and the embed platform, which is now able to run um, Java ME. And so there are, uh, together with this announcement, there were a few um, hardware announcements as well of, of some gateways that are um, yeah, capable of uh, running several protocols at the same time. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so let's, uh, well, let, Let's start talking about the actual, what I think is the tricky part, or at least what um, yeah, many people don't really think about uh, when they start prototyping. I mean, I'm sure many of you guys have been playing with Arduinos and um, well, maybe even with blinking LEDs with Raspberry Pis and stuff. If you're just building one solution that you're going to deploy on your um, in your house, then, well, I guess that's fine. You can always find a way to SSH into the machine, uh, reboot uh, either, I mean, do a software reboot or physically unplug and replug the device if something is is, is gonna, is, is just not working. But then what, what do you do when you're actually talking about going production and having several hundreds of thousands of devices on the field? You need to have solutions for managing the gateway itself. So yeah, back to uh, to the, the industrial gateway we mentioned earlier. Uh, the um, the gateway is likely embedding Wi-Fi and or cellular connectivity. So how do you manage uh, the settings for for the Wi-Fi and the cellular connectivity? The gateway is essentially uh, in addition to be an application container it's also a router so how do you manage the firewall over the air um, and especially how do you do that for uh, several devices at the same time what is what is enabling uh, you to manage a fleet of device uh, and a fleet of applications as well uh, your gateway is going to act uh, well, the main goal of the gateway is probably to make sure that your IoT solution is going to be connected to the internet 24-7 uh, or at, at least uh, as much as possible. But then also the gateway will be your container for, uh, for your IoT applications. So um, is it enough to have just Linux uh, and the JVM to, to, to run applications? So whether, uh, I mean, are you going to run uh, Docker, uh, uh, or uh, are you going to use Puppet to manage your, your very constrained devices? Well, I'm not quite sure, so you, you need to have uh, some uh, some solutions for that. Installing the apps, starting them, stopping them, making, having, uh, accessing the logs uh, easily. Um, and yeah, all in all, what you want is some sort of, um, as I said earlier, an operating system for IoT that's going to allow you to manage the gateway, manage the applications, and provide you with all the abstractions you need for the underlying uh, hardware. You want a, a nice abstraction for the GPS, for uh, for the, the the IOs. So, well, I mentioned that uh, well, Java is getting better at, at that, with especially with device IO. But still, uh, there are a few things for which you need some dedicated APIs. And uh, well, that OS um, would be or could be. Eclipse Cura. Eclipse Cura is running on, on top of, uh, it's really meant to run on a gateway. So uh, a gateway, uh, it's, we're not targeting ME, right? It's, it's really, uh, a gateway is probably not even battery powered. It might be wireless uh, connectivity, but it's definitely uh, not battery powered. It's meant to have enough processing power to bridge uh, devices, sensors, to the internet and it, it has enough processing power to uh, provide you with a complete application framework for your IoT apps. So it runs on top of Java and OSGI and it provides you basically with uh, several services that will allow you to manage your gateway, manage your network, have uh, pre-bundled uh, versions of uh, protocols that you may need to use 
for i mean if we're talking about a gateway that is embedded in a car then you want a canvas implementation canvas is a protocol for for talking to your um odb2 um you know diagnostic um, port so that would be the kind of stuff you need and then so that would be uh, basically yeah, providing services for you to build your own applications using using the the, the field protocols etc etc but even if you were to not write your own applications uh, well Kurai in itself is gonna um, uh, is gonna still provide you with uh, the kind of features you would expect from a, uh, a router or a, yeah or a, a DSL router or any kind of router basically as in it provides uh, APIs um, for doing uh, the management as well as a, a, a UI for basically you open your web browser and you're able to to uh, uh, connect directly to the gate to the gateway and start managing and changing some settings or you do that using APIs if you want to do some bulk changes right you have um, 10 cars on the field or 10 um, delivery trucks for which uh, an app needs to be upgraded then you will likely not uh, want to open 10 web browsers and do this uh, one by one you might want to use MQTT uh, to push uh, some device management oriented kind of messages to 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 change settings of, of the on the gateways right uh, installing Cura, well, again, prototyping on the Raspberry Pi would probably be a good uh, a good idea. Uh, turns out there is a Debian package for easily installing the Raspberry Pi uh, on, on on the Raspberry Pi. So uh, make sure that your um, uh, your repo definitions are up to date. Uh, install, uh, download the Debian package. It's uh, not available in an official repo yet, but I mean it doesn't matter much. You download the Debian package. Make sure that the um, any uh, dependency of the package are going to be installed uh, by uh, running that command, and basically you're good to go. Uh, which means that you will have, as I said, some services that are provided out of the box, even if you're not yet talking about and thinking about running your own app. You will have uh, all uh, the features, including the web UI for managing those features for the network management, for managing the OSGI uh, apps and bundles that are running on your system. You can manage uh, as well the, um, the connectivity to an, to an IoT cloud. That is, uh, earlier we've seen the MQTT API, right, to communicate to a server, but as, uh, I mean, uh, in Cura, the idea is that an application developer doesn't really want to have to um, handle the the disconnection from the network, which quite frankly happens a lot, right? Uh, when you do wireless and 2G, 3G kind of stuff. So you want the framework to actually take care of uh, buffering all the, the messages that all the applications uh, running in the framework want to send to the to a server and uh, yeah so basically that would be the kind of services that that Cura would, would provide and uh, as an app developer you have APIs that you can leverage to uh, well the, basically what I just described about the the cloud communication would be via the data or cloud service that is an abstraction of your uh, communication to the cloud and basically you just um, push data uh, through through uh, these services and eventually the data is going to be sent by the framework if uh, the connection is well and and well configured and stuff there are also services for ciphering your communication services for accessing the, um, the geolocation of the device so that would be the kind of APIs but first uh, and, and I'll take uh, questions after the, the, the first part of, of the demo let's see how it looks when you actually install Cura as I just described you take your your vanilla Raspberry Pi install the Debian package and you end up having a um, solution for monitoring uh, your IoT gateway so that is the web UI for Cura, uh, so uh, pretty similar to what you would have in a, in a router, right? So you can, yeah, monitor the, the status of the device. So that, well, I do have a Raspberry Pi, 
MAC address is uh, this and that. I don't have a GPS, but I can actually monitor the bundles that are running in my system. I can, uh, again, thinking about not wanting uh, or not having to SSH into the system, I can execute a command, right? Uh, right from my, my web UI. Idea, the idea being, being that uh, eventually this is something I will do uh, uh, for a fleet of device, right? Uh, being able to do that from the web UI is pretty convenient, but eventually I'm going to do that using MQTT. Um, and by the way, the MQTT communication I will have configured from the uh, from the web UI here. What is the broker? Uh, what is the server that my um, uh, gateway is going to talk to? Are there some credentials? Is there? Uh, uh, yeah, what is the the connection policy? And from that point, basically, uh, it's going to be uh, Kura's job to make sure that my gateway is always connected, uh, so as not only it can be managed uh, remotely and headlessly over MQTT, but also in order to provide um, connectivity to my applications. Uh, as we will see in a few minutes, I have a, a demo of a connected greenhouse that greenhouse, I want to be able to easily send the data without even knowing whether uh, the connection is up or down. It's going to be up to the um, to Cura to uh, eventually send the data. So yeah, all the um, OSGI bundles may expose some some settings. So these are uh, built-in OSGI bundles. This is actually the app we're going to see in just a few uh, moments. Uh, this app. I built myself and this app I installed right from the web UI. Basically, you take uh, a deployment package, uh, it's basically a zip file containing OSGI bundles, and you upload that to the gateway, and the gateway is going to deploy the OSGI bundles and run them. Uh, you could again also do that uh, over MQTT um, and basically publish a message on a specific topic for the gateway to notice and 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 yeah basically download the package from uh, from wherever it is on your on, uh, on the internet and install the packet so that's um that's the yeah the the web ui for for cura um, and then very uh, quickly you're going to want to either deploy applications that other people uh, have written like if you have, uh, yeah, you want to deploy a home automation solution that is already existing, well, maybe you will just want to download that, or uh, more likely you will want to write your own, which is what we will uh, see in just a few minutes, uh, and we will see some code. But I will actually take some questions on that part if there are any. Yeah, we've got uh, we've got a couple. Let me uh, go back to IRC and grab them. I can find them. Here we go. Right. So we have um, we have one from I am IT. Uh, does uh, does Eclipse Cura comprise ZB as field protocol? Uh, no, I don't think they do. Uh, but basically, you would need to use a. Uh, yeah, an existing Java implementation, uh, wrap that into an OSGI bundle if it's not already done, and then you would uh, yeah, basically have uh, once and for all um, a, the library and the bundle available for anyone to consume in, inside the framework. But no, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure they don't have uh, ZigBee implementation. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, and we have another question about MQT, uh, when we were talking about MQTT. Do you want to take that now or later? Well, uh, actually, you tell me. I, I don't know how much time we have. I'm, I'm uh, super fine taking the question now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, so it's from uh, uh, Ingenarius, um, and he's asking if uh, MQTT can be uh, used alongside an artificial intelligence framework like Jade or Jess. So, sorry, do you mind repeating the question? I was actually checking can, Twitter. I apologize. <laughs> uh, no worries. Uh, can MQTT um, be used or applied with an artificial intelligence framework like Jade and Jess? 
Huh, I've heard about some people doing uh, doing that in the past. Uh, I'm not quite sure off the top of my head. I would remember uh, we did that, uh, but uh, I guess the answer is I don't see why not. Uh, I don't have any particular experience in that, but uh, I guess the, yeah, this would open the door to some uh, interesting use cases. Yeah, no, I mean I can't think on the top of my head why you wouldn't be able to do that. It's just a case of calling MQTT based on the AI recommendations, I guess. But, uh, uh, so if yeah, there's any yeah. other questions, uh, please put them into IRC now. Um, and, uh, and as that's happening, I'll, uh, I'll hand over back to you, Ben. Cool. Uh, yeah, second part of the demo is how would you um, build, write your own application? Um, and in my case, the um, that would be a very simple scenario I would like to implement. That is a greenhouse uh, um, for which I want to monitor the temperature and for which I want to be able to control um, the lighting. To, I want to be able to turn um, the lighting on or off. So um, starting from scratch, well, uh, how could I do that? Um, well, maybe I would start by providing my own abstraction of, uh, of a, um, a, a sensor on top of Pi4j. Um, so to be complete here, the, um, the the Kura team is actually working on making uh, um, on on getting rid of Pi4j basically and relying directly on device I/O. And it's very likely that as part of this uh, refactoring, uh, there will be um, a built-in service that you will be able to leverage. But I mean, the idea here is that my sensor service uh, is really meant to provide exactly the kind of APIs I'm. Uh, I want in the context of my uh, application, but uh, yeah. So I would have this uh, this uh, sensor service, and then once um, so yeah. Assuming you guys are a bit familiar with OSGI, the idea is uh, that a service is basically going to be uh, well a POJO that you yeah, that you uh, register in a, in a service registry for anyone to be able to discover and consume. So uh, the uh, the service is basically an API, is an interface, and you can provide uh, an, impl an implementation which is going to be the POJO, and then you uh, yeah you declare that implementation uh, and make sure that basically anyone is going to be able to consume that. So uh, not only will I provide a central service, but there are also some built-in services in Cura that that we mentioned uh, in the past, like the data service. So in my case, I'm going to build uh, a component that, that is going to consume the sensor service to make sure that I actually have a way to interact with the GPIOs, uh, get the temperature, control the LED. But then the component is also going to consume the data service to have a way to uh, subscribe to the broker, uh, make sure that uh, if a command is being sent to control the LED, we're going to receive the message, or uh, we're going to be able to send the temperature as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, a, a couple other things to make sure that we can be notified whenever the GPIO changes. So it's also going to be in the form of a um, a service. Basically, my my uh, the component in charge of uh, controlling the greenhouse is basically register uh, going to register itself as a sensor change listener, so as whenever uh, somewhere uh, outside of the component there is an actual change, um, well, we're going to be notified. And then the last thing we're going to do is provide some uh, configuration metadata. This is actually based on um, an OSGI standard specification, which is going to allow us uh, to provide some, uh, to declare what are the settings that uh, our application uh, slash component is going to expose. So as for example, and as we've seen before, uh, it's going to be available in the web UI. I want my web UI to allow me to uh, to configure um, uh, what is the MQTT topic that my greenhouse is, uh, uh, is using to communicate, for example, right? So let's uh, have a quick look at some of the code uh, this is actually, I think, um, four bundles. 
the fifth one being well actually we've talked about uh, what it means to to and how we would simulate turns out that i actually have a simulator of my uh, sensors uh, this is one thing that is actually nice with osgi uh, yeah let's see actually the sensor service i mentioned first thing i i want to do is um, provide um, the interface the api of what i think uh, for me, in the context of the, the greenhouse, is a sensor. I don't really want to manipulate directly the GPIOs from my application, as in, I don't want, uh, when I want to retrieve a temperature, I'm not sure I want to uh, manipulate APIs that say uh, GPIO number 27 and blah and blah. I rather uh, get sensor value uh, of temperature sensor, right? So that's the kind of API I would like. Uh, I also want an API to change uh, the value uh, to turn an LED on, for example. So that's my abstraction of a sensor service. And from that point, I can actually uh, decide to either provide an implementation in, in the form of an actual bundle relying on uh, Py4j for doing the, um, the stuff or I can provide an alternative implementation which will uh, basically uh, use uh, timer tasks and whatnot to uh, randomly uh, generate sensor values, right? And to, uh, uh, but for, um, uh, for the application developer, for the, the, the guy who will eventually write the code uh, to take the value from the sensor and send the value to the, um, the cloud, it's not gonna make any difference. It's gonna be a sensor service anyways. So uh, the actual implementation, as I said, it's a bundle that uh, relies on Py4j and provide an implementation of a sensor service. What does it mean? Uh, well, among other things, uh, we want to uh, handle both uh, temperature and light sensors kind of stuff. And reading the temperature, that would actually be uh, manipulating the GPIO APIs uh, from Py4j. So uh, if you remember, I was mentioning that uh, manipulating sensors is usually pretty straightforward. Well, it is, but you will need to, uh, you may need to have a look at the data sheet of your sensor. Uh, that would be actually the very uh, sensor I'm using. Uh, the data sheet will be available here and it basically explains what kind of messages you need to send, what is the local protocol for getting value from the sensor and yeah you get raw value, you need to do some uh, bit manipulation and eventually you get your temperature and you return, you return the value. So that's my POJO implementation and since we are talking OSGI then at some point the POJO I expose it to and I register it against the um, the service registry, the OSGI service registry. So I can do that using uh, uh, OSGI's declarative services. And basically, let me look at the WYSIWYG editor. It's going to be easier. Okay, so I want to uh, to register um, this um, class. Uh, I want to instantiate one, one Py4j greenhouse sensor service and make that available for anyone to consume and I actually want to make that available as an implementation of a sensor service. Uh, so yeah, in a nutshell that would be how uh, I do the first part of my implementation. Uh, back to the very beginning of the presentation, the part that is talking to the sensors and then the part that is in charge of bridging uh, the sensors to the internet would be the what I call the publisher. So the publisher is another component that uh, my uh, OSGI framework is going to instantiate for me. Uh, it's um, uh, yeah, first first time the framework is going to start. It's going to look at instantiating this uh, this publisher. Granted that all the dependencies are met, which is uh, I want to consume both the MQTT data service, if you remember, as well as the greenhouse sensor service. So provided that I have them, my Pojo is going to be instantiated. And what is it going to do? Well, I guess it's going to, uh, among other things, whenever, uh, well, we can have a look actually at what happens whenever a message arrives. 
um, depending on uh, the, the the topic I'm I'm listening to. I know how my topic is structured. First part is going to be uh, the um, a specific prefix that is actually going to be uh, a setting of the app, as, as we're going to see in just a few minutes, and then and blah blah blah. That's how my my topic is structured. And if it turns out it's actually a message asking to change the status of the of the lighting, then I'm going to uh, rely on the sensor service to to change the actual value of uh, physically to, to toggle the light. And on the other end, if I want to um, to publish the temperature, I would be notified whenever the sensor value is changed. And then in that case, I rely on the data service to publish the data. But the interesting part here is that uh, nowhere in uh, these uh, 200-ish uh, lines of code, I, um, I've um, uh, I've handled the MQTT connection. The, the, the Cura framework is again taking care of uh, making sure that the connection is always up and running. And I don't even mention here what is the, the broker, what is the server I, I want to talk to. It's external, uh, it's defined externally from, from my app. So um, yeah, just a last word about uh, the settings of the app. Um, so that would be the properties of my component. And actually, uh, those uh, properties can be, um, yeah, they are declared uh, via this XML file. It's called uh, OSGI meta type. And basically, you have uh, the description of, of uh, the kind of settings you would expect and what if you want to constrain the, some settings in a specific range and stuff like that. This is how you would do it, right? And eventually, so I have my four bundles. I build them, I package them in the form of a, uh, of a zip file that I install in my Cura installation, which I did already. And I basically end up with not only the ability to manage the settings that we've seen earlier, but I actually end up with a, a, a running application, right? So um, my app is using uh, this MQTT prefix to publish temperature data to uh, the Eclipse IoT broker. Uh, this is also the topic uh, where commands might be posted. And so the app is actually running. And if you guys want to, well, let me just first uh, demo it. And after that, you can uh, play as well. So if you go to iot.eclipse.org slash demo, you actually have a web UI. Uh, I don't know what this one is. You should have uh, the webcam over here. Not sure why it's broken, but I'm going to run the webcam locally anyways. So this is going to, this is the greenhouse uh, that is running uh, a few, well, in actually uh, in, in my living room. Uh, and this is a web UI that is running MQTT over WebSocket. Whenever I press the toggle button, I'm actually going to send a, uh, an MQTT message on the topic uh, uh, namespace we've seen earlier. And hopefully I'm going to toggle the LED off. Hopefully. Well, looks like there is a lag. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the, the webcam stream is uh, exactly, not exactly uh, live, uh, but still. Um, and the temperature, of course, would, would change uh, if, I, if I were to, to put my finger on the temperature sensor or, or something like that. So that's, um, that's all running MQ on, uh, on MQTT. And a few more uh, things that are actually quite interesting in the demo is that when you are um, running in Eclipse and as, as um, when, when you are, I mean, when you are developing the application, well, you will not necessarily always want to build your final application package, deploy that. Uh, you are actually more in development slash debug mode, right? So the, the, the nice thing is that you can use um, an Eclipse plugin to uh, connect to your remote OSGI environment, to your Cura environment. So in my case, I've already set up the, the settings to connect to my uh, Raspberry Pi on my uh, local network and to the, the uh, management OSGI management port. So let's connect to the framework. And basically, when I, how I now have access to uh, all the, the bundles that are running. And what I could do uh, is basically change some stuff. 
in uh, the settings that I want my application to expose, uh, let's say I want to um, uh, have a password uh, to cipher my MQDT messages. So I guess that would be a string. Uh, that the string would be uh, well would be optional. Default would be secret and uh, a super secret. Right, let's uh, build the, the bundle, the, the jar file corresponding to my uh, to my USGI bundle. So that will be by using the Eclipse uh, plugin development environment. Let's build a jar file. Uh, that, sure that would be the bundle I want to export. Putting it on my desktop, building, and then what if I were to update it uh, on the fly? That's what is really neat with OSGI, that you can do this kind of stuff. Uh, plugins. Okay. Back to the settings. I guess I need to refresh the UI. And I do have a new uh, setting, which is optional, so we don't have the star over here. So that's pretty convenient. Um, I'm sure you would agree to do live development and of course I could have changed some stuff in my in my Java code as well. So uh, I think that's pretty much it for the demo. Maybe the second part would be uh, briefly mentioning that it would be very easy to add co-op support. Uh, back to the question earlier, does it make sense to have both MQTT and co-op? Uh, well, in the context of this demo, I don't see why not, especially once you already have the central service, it's very easy to um, to provide a co-op servlet, uh, if you will, that will basically just uh, forward uh, whatever uh, co-op requests uh, are uh, being sent to the, um, uh, to the central service. So, which is exactly what I did in another uh, OSGI bundle that you may have seen uh, in my workspace. It's actually already deployed in my um, in my runtime. So if I were to use uh, this Firefox plugin to do uh, co-op kind of stuff, then uh, I could, uh, where is my webcam again? It's here. Uh, that That is a co-op um, uh, plugin that allows me to basically discover what are all the resources that are that are exposed by my uh, by my co-op endpoint. And then I can uh, say get the status of the LED. The LED is on. I can observe that. And if you guys, I, I think you guys were actually blinking the LED. So if you do keep uh, blinking the LED, we're going to see that it's going to change light over here or I guess I can do that myself over here. Toggle, and now it's off, right? And this is all, uh, well, co-op is very bandwidth efficient. So if you were to use, uh, say, Wireshark to uh, monitor the traffic uh, on your network, you, you would see that um, having this particular workflow where uh, I'm being notified whenever the value changes, it's very, very lightweight. I can also uh, put a uh, a message to turn the LED on and hopefully, well, there is really a, a significant lag on the, on the webcam. I don't know why, but let's see. Uh, okay, what else do I have for you? Not sure I have uh, uh, much left. Uh, in terms of end user interaction, we've basically covered uh, MQTT over web sockets, which I love. It's really convenient to uh, Basically, well, basically look at the source code of uh, iot.eclipse.org slash demo. Uh, you'll see that in just a couple lines of Java code, you can do uh, MQTT, uh, publish and subscribe. Uh, if you want to run on Android, there is a, an Android service that is basically wrapping the, the MQTT Java client. Uh, one thing that I did uh, recently was also to play with the Java with JavaFX charts API. I might actually have that in my workspace if I don't. Uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's not in this workspace. But yeah, basically in just a few lines of code, uh, you can build live uh, charts with. Uh, I mean the uh, uh, the axis would scale automatically and stuff like that, which is. I mean I, I really like that. Uh, so this is yeah, basically what you could use to do um, the end user interaction. But again, I mean, you may have understood uh, 
uh, that I, I think actually the important part and uh, most of the, the tricky stuff happens on the gateway. And this is why having a, uh, something like Cura is really helping quite a lot. Uh, top three, top three of the thing you should uh, uh, keep in mind after uh, this session. Cura is pretty neat. You should uh, definitely check it out. Uh, go to uh, eclipse.org slash Cura if you want to build uh, something very similar to the greenhouse I just demoed, or something exactly similar. You go to iot.eclipse.org slash java tutorial. You have all the instructions to replicate the, the demo. You have the um, the zip file with the, the deployment package that you can uh, install directly on the Raspberry Pi if you don't want to basically develop the source code from, from scratch. Um, and in general, if you want to learn more about uh, what is available for uh, uh, Java developers, there are some other technologies I didn't mention, like uh, Eclipse Smart Home, if you want to do home automation kind of stuff, Eclipse SCADA, OM2M, these would be other open source uh, projects for IoT and Java that you may want to check out. Um, if you do build uh, or if you do uh, yeah, start playing with the technology, uh, please be in touch. I would love to, to, to see and know uh, what you guys are doing. If you, uh, if you ever stumble upon, uh, upon bugs or uh, have feature requests and stuff, um, yeah, just make yourself known and uh, uh, we'd be happy to have your help on, on the projects. Obviously, I'm Kurt Ben on Twitter, uh, and iot.eclipse.org would be where you go to learn more. Thanks. It was great to talk to you virtually. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, thank, thanks very much, Ben. And uh, I, I was going to ask one, one final question at the end, which was about uh, where uh, where people can, can learn more or, or hear more announcements about IoT and things like that. I guess you answered that on the final slide, iot.eclipse.org, was it? Yes, exactly. OK, perfect. Um, and the other thing I'm going to do, I'm going to put into the IRC right now uh, the, the virtual IoT meetup. Um, so this is, this is um, a, a, a virtu another virtual group which, uh, which Ben runs with, um, with uh, Ian Scarrett, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we've... Uh, been inspired by what you guys did. Uh, we started that I think end of August. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, the virtual IoT meetup. Uh, we've we've we're just done with the first series of webinar uh, that you could actually check out on YouTube uh, if you want to learn more about all the projects I talked about today. And yeah, we're looking at uh, doing more of these in the future. If actually, if some of you guys would be interested in being speakers, uh, make sure to be in touch, and otherwise stay tuned for um, yeah, what we will have in the next couple of weeks. Awesome, thanks. And uh, the other thing I'll say is uh, there's a, I think there's a qu another question in, uh, in IRC, but I think if we're over time, it's probably best we, uh, we do that in IRC. Um, so, uh, so I'll just finally say, everyone who loves virtual stuff, go and join the, uh, the virtual IoT group. That's uh, I linked in, um, in uh, in IRC just now, and I'll, I'll make sure that's on on the comment on the uh, on the virtual uh, jug uh, meetup as well on the on the on the event. And just leaves me to say thank you very much um, to to Ben for for a great presentation. Thanks to Oleg for handling Twitter. And uh, who knows, maybe one day we'll see you guys again on the on on the virtual jug. So uh, thanks very much, Ben, and uh, see you guys all next time. Thanks. Take care, all. Bye bye. Bye, guys.